Well, most of you, I think, know by now that we are the Knoxville History Project, and our mission is to research and promote the history and culture of Knoxville. It's a pleasure to do it. Um, don't really have many, uh, much of announcements this week, but um, also want to thank uh, council members Lynn Fugate and Charles Thomas for supporting the History Project, and particularly this series uh, through their 202 funds. And a special thank you this week for Rosalind uh, Hackett, uh, University of Tennessee professor, uh, for sponsoring this talk today with, with Paul Brown and Jack Neely. So thank you, Rosalind. We sincerely appreciate the support and sponsoring this series. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jack and uh, we'll say a few things about Paul Brown. Thank you, Jack. Well, thank you, uh, Paul. And thanks for, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I uh, thought it'd be appropriate on, at the end here, at the end of uh, Women's History Month to uh, talk about one, one more really remarkable woman and her name is, uh, is Frances Hodgson Burnett. Uh, the fact that a, a, a very English author, uh, uh, born in, and spent her early childhood in England and is, is always identified for her Englishness uh, and, and her was one of the most uh, popular writers of any gender or nationality of an English language in the Victorian era. Uh, was a, a very, very successful novelist, um, that she had any connection to Knoxville is, 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 uh, might be astonishing to people. She is, of course, the author of uh, The Secret Garden, um, uh, the, which has been made into approximately a dozen movies. Can you believe that? I just heard that there was a new one out last year that I haven't seen yet, but, but there's a great one back in 1993 with uh, uh, Dame Maggie Smith uh, in one of the lead roles. Uh, but a, a classic one from 1949 with uh, uh, Dean Stockwell and Margaret O'Brien. That's a that's a great version too. Uh, even if you haven't read the book, but if, if you have a if you have a kid, especially a, a, a female kid, I think they they need to see these movies and read the book. I, my my uh, daughter certainly enjoyed both uh, both forms of the of the of the story. Just just a great story. But she also wrote A Little Princess, uh, also known as Sarah Crew, uh, which uh, was also a, 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 has been a, a movie or two. And uh, to another generation, I think, she was best known as the author of Little Lord, Lord Fauntleroy. Um, and uh, it's, you can kind of tell how uh, long ago someone wrote something in Knoxville when they referred to uh, Frances Hodgson Burnett for what she's best famous for. But I think for the last 35 years or so, uh, the Secret Garden has been ascendant as her as her best known book. Uh, she wrote dozens of books and uh, and uh, and dozens and dozens of, of short stories. And I've counted on IMDb at least fifty movies since the silent era have been made of, uh, of Francis Hodgson Burnett's work, or at least inspired by it. That's astonishing. And and to think that I mean they're still being made today. About a half a dozen of them were made in the last decade or so. Uh, so it's, uh, she's, uh, is, is evergreen for a woman who died in 1924, uh, is still, uh, inspiring people today. Um, she, uh, she spent about a, a decade of her youth here in Knoxville and in the, in the surrounding area, even began her writing career later. Uh, her first, uh, uh, stories were written and published here. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to, uh, to, to Mr. Brown. Um, but also and also inspired uh, one of her first novels uh, called Vagabondia. Um, uh, very, very little of her Knoxville exists. And I, we have a picture of one, one uh, item that does exist, and that's the grave of her mother, uh, which is at Old Gray Cemetery. Here's a picture of it uh, right here. And you can't quite read it, uh, but it says that she was uh, the wife of uh, Edwin Hodgson uh, of Manchester, England. Um, but uh, he had died before they came here, but uh, uh, her uh, Francis Hosburn's mother, um, uh, uh, Eliza, lived here in Knoxville until her death in 1870. And this is, I think, one of the very few, I think the only remnant of, of the Hodgson's that's visible uh, in a public place today. Um, but uh, there are just a couple of buildings still around connected to her time in Knoxville. And uh, I, I don't, we have a, a picture of one. She did a lot of mailing while she was here in town, mailing stories back and forth. And uh, one, uh, the, uh, the place that she would go to mail things was of course the post office. And here's the post office that we know best, best as the history center today. This, is, this was the post office that was actually built during the time that she was here. And uh, by the time she was 25 or so, it was completed. And this was the, 
this was the main post office that was known to men and women, black and white people, everybody knew the post office and used it on a regular basis. Um, but uh, we're lucky that's still there with the, uh, the rest of the history center now uh, appended to the, uh, to the eastern side of it. But anyway, uh, our guest tonight is, uh, is Mr. Paul Brown, uh, a, a former school teacher, uh, now a freelance writer, uh, and the author of, of Rufus, uh, a, a book about James Agee's youth in Knoxville, the author James Agee, who's been the subject of several uh, pretty good biographies. Uh, but Paul, none of them have brought out nearly the detail of Agee's uh, youth in, in Knoxville and East Tennessee in general uh, that, that Paul Brown did. Uh, he won a, a statewide uh, historical accommodation for this book, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, great, a great piece of work. Uh, and um, and uh, he spoke to us about that and, and Agee-related subjects uh, on one of our early Zooms last summer uh, during the early part of the lockdown. Uh, but he's back to uh, talk about Francis Hodgson Burnett, uh, who had, he has studied uh, as as thoroughly, I think, as he studied Agee's, Agee's youth. Uh, he spoke on the subject uh, at the one of our bowling alley talks about three years ago um, at on the uh, occasion of the 150th anniversary of the first publication of her short stories, uh, which she wrote in Knoxville and uh, and and sent off and were published, and she actually helped helped uh, uh, support her struggling family in Knoxville in the eight, late 1860s in this kind of shell-shocked city where you could see the scars of the Civil War everywhere. Uh, they, this is where she spent her, her adolescence. And uh, as, uh, as a 19 year old, uh, 18, 19 year old uh, young woman was, uh, was, was helping pay her family's bills by writing fiction for big magazines out of New York and, and elsewhere. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, uh, Paul's uh, uh, connections to James Agee and Francis Osmernet would not seem to have anything to do with each other. They were they didn't uh, really overlap much. Didn't know each other certainly, um, but uh, but he's found a few surprising uh, overlaps and uh, with hers and Agee's biographies that I, I'll let him him talk about. But uh, but recently a few uh, months ago he uh, uh, Paul uh, Brown published uh, actually uh, almost two years ago now. A couple of, uh, of stories about Francis Burnett in the uh, Journal of East, East Tennessee History, and this is this is not Francis Burnett on the cover; it's Dolly Parton, but it's a uh, it's a, a really fascinating uh, uh, two part story. They they couldn't contain it in just one issue. A two part story about Francis Haas Burnett, uh, and uh, and and look for that if you can find it. Uh, it's uh, it's a great uh, a great piece of work. Uh, but without further further ado, I want to uh, welcome uh, 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 Paul Brown uh, to, to join us and, and talk about uh, the uh, the interesting career of, of Francis Hodgson Burnett, who, uh, who who was born and raised in England uh, in Manchester, but came over here as a teenager and uh, and and uh, began a, an astonishing career as a writer. But Paul, uh, welcome again, welcome back to uh, to the to uh, the, the History Happy Hour uh, on. Uh, yeah. The National History Project. Uh, Thank good you. To have you. Appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation and uh, to Paul and Nicole as well for uh, all you all do to uh, help preserve Knoxville history. Uh, it's you all are our treasures for sure, and uh, we all appreciate you. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's always fun to uh, talk about writers who grew up in Knoxville, and it's it's always tempting to want to look through their work. Um, and, and find connections and see if there's anything, any people or places that, that we know or, or that used to be here uh, hidden or maybe thinly disguised in their work. Um, I'll have to say, um, compared to James Agee, um, Francis Hodgson Burnett is, is tricky. And of course their writing styles are vastly different. Uh, uh, you know, Francis Hodgson Burnett was very Victorian and. Um, whereas James Agee was often almost as concerned with place, uh, setting his characters firmly in a particular location and describing that location to where you could, you could walk the same streets of Knoxville that he wrote about and, and know where you were. Um, Frances Hodgson Burnett, her work is uh, much more plot driven um, character driven. Um, she's, she's not quite as concerned with, with place. Although, um, in a few of her stories, she, 
her fiction, um, you know, there, there are little hints of her life uh, in, that she uh, experienced here in Knoxville. The thing is about her work, she was so darn prolific. I mean, she wrote hundreds of stories um, over, you know, she wrote over 50 stories just during her, uh, her time in, in Knoxville or East Tennessee, uh, I should say. So digging into all those is, is uh, quite a challenging task. And I've, I've, I've only read a handful of her stories um, out of all the ones she wrote. And so I'm sure there's stuff in there that, that people could find. Um, but she also, uh, Jack mentioned the, the novel Vagabondia that she wrote, um, and largely based on um, her experiences living with her siblings in, the, in a big house and living as bohemians. Uh, in Knoxville down by the river, uh, she actually set that. I mean, she, she described uh, scenes and, and characters uh, as they probably appeared in Knoxville, but she set the story in London. Um, so you would never know that it's, it's based on a Knoxville story unless you knew the, the background. So, um, so again, trying to, to find parallels between her her uh, fictional settings and her life here is, is tricky. Um, James Agee often didn't disguise his, his characters and his settings as much. Um, and like I said, setting I think was, was a lot more uh, important and, and much more of a driving force in Agee's work. Yeah, pa Paula, let's, let's talk, give a little grounding in her background. She was born in Manchester, England. And if anybody knows anything about Manchester's history, it's a very industrial mm -hmm. city. It's a, it's, a, it's a knitting mill city, more or less, and mm -hmm. was, was heavily dependent on the American cotton market. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny uh, to think about how global history is. I always talk about how much uh, the Irish famine and the German revolutions and things like that affected Knoxville. Un, as unlikely as that may seem, but the American Civil War uh, much affected uh, Manchester, England, and and uh, it was a, 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 a massive. I think they called it the Cotton Famine right. that they they that they experienced in uh, in Manchester as a result of the Civil War. Everybody was losing their jobs, and it was it was horrible, uh, and uh, and people were fleeing Manchester, uh, coming to America because of the American Civil War. It, it's uh, it, ironically. Uh, but uh, this this happened, uh, and the the Hodgson family had not only that to deal with, but the fact that their father uh, had John Hodgson had had died uh, fairly young, and left a, a widow with uh, to raise several children. How, how many? There were four or five children, I guess. There were five. Uh, there were two brothers and and three girls. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Francis she, was the, the second child, second eldest yeah. child. But Eliza brought this whole brood over, uh, not knowing uh, for sure what she was going to find. Her wow. brother, right, had a dry goods store in Knoxville. Named William uh, Boone or Bond mm -hmm. uh, was uh, was had a had a store here. And uh, biographers tend to uh, see if you would agree. Tend to say to assume that that he exaggerated his wow. his prosperity in America mm -hmm. because they got here and they found he was not. A very wealthy man at all. Um, mm -hmm. It almost sounds like a story that to uh, yeah. like one of her stories in a way that she would they would come here and find that reality was very different from. Uh, sure. from the, and uh, yeah, and it may be that the circumstances had just changed. Um, you know, he he did seem to be very prosperous. He owned uh, quite a few tracts of land in in and around Knoxville. Um, um, I don't I don't remember exactly when at least since the uh, early 1860s um, is, is when some of the first advertisements for his grocery business uh, on Gay Street show up in, in the newspaper archives. Um, but he, uh, it, you know, he, he obviously was uh, um, quite prosperous at one point, but then of course the war and the, the various occupations of Knoxville um, you know, I, I think it might have actually been the war's end that that kind of had a detrimental effect on his business because with all these uh, various soldiers in town, you know, he he might have had uh, 
a booming booming business there uh, during the war. But then when it ended, um, you know, which which uh, by then uh, around May 1865 is when the um, the Hodgson family uh, left England uh, from Liverpool on a ship crossing the Atlantic and went through Quebec eventually uh, by summer. And um, so by the time they arrived, the, the war was pretty much over, but, but Knoxville had, had kind of suffered through two occupations, at least two, right, Jack? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, back and forth a couple times, yeah, but it, but it was, uh, but they arrived here roughly, didn't you know exactly like what month or whatever they arrived, was it no, in 1865 uh, approximately, or? Um, it, it was, it would have still been in 1865, sometime in the summer, um, the, I found a Canadian passenger list, um, from when they, uh, they arrived in Quebec and that was in June 20, that was June 22nd. So okay. it would have taken them probably, you know, two or three more weeks to yeah. travel by train. Yeah. Down but in, 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 in Knoxville is still under, under occupation, martial law, more or less at the time for another year or so. And, and yeah. to imagine them coming here and there were uh, a lot of them were African-American troops who were here, the colored infantry and artillery who were in charge of, uh, of, of Knoxville uh, keeping order here. So mm -hmm. that must have been uh, startling to, to find, uh, to, to say the least, uh, to, to, to arrive into that uh, scenario. But uh, but they got here and uh, and they they uh, first do, you, do we know uh, for years people have said something about the possibility that they, that they lived at the Lamar house at one time and I, I know that we've looked at for that and not found as much uh, uh, evidence yeah. of that as we there there were a couple people that uh, that might have been the source of that information um, one, one of them is no longer living and uh, I, I think it was. Uh, David Madden that yeah. uh, was another possibility and I contacted him and he he wasn't sure the source of that that tidbit um, it's it's intriguing to think of of them living there of course I know uh, uh, Francis was um, was associated with the Lamar house just through um, the various dances and with her her younger brother John uh, working there at the saloon um, but but no, unfortunately, that that first summer, their their first months in in uh, Tennessee, there aren't many records to show yeah. their movements during that time. Yeah, and and she was this is before her birthday that year, so she was 15 years old, I guess, when she first arrived in yeah. in uh, in Knoxville, and then they did, did they they went to New Market right away, right? Was that the the first mm -hmm. uh, known uh, place that they lived? Yes, yeah, the as far as I can tell. Um, they they went up there because um, William Boone also had some sort of a uh, a part to play in a, uh, uh, a a mill of some kind up there, and uh, it's it was said it was a, a grain or grist mill, but I've also heard it say that it was a, a textile mill um, owned by somebody else. So he basically uh, uh, Francis's uncle didn't have you know, his business just couldn't support that many uh, workers there in Knoxville. So he, he sent the, most of the family, all except for the eldest boy, uh, sent them up to Newmarket uh, with the younger boy working, I believe, up in Dandridge at, at this, this mill. So the family was very poor. They rented this little log cabin uh, on the road between Knoxville and Morristown. And, um, and you know, they were obviously poor. I mean, the, as much as they didn't want to accept the, the help of their neighbors, um, the, the neighbors recognized their, their needs and, and found ways to help them out. And, and Francis later talked about all the, the angels in Newmarket that, um, that attended their needs. Um, yeah. and of course, this, their circumstances also are, are what prompted uh, Francis to think of ways to contribute to the family income. And so she started this little school for neighborhood kids uh, up in the second story of their log cabin and basically just charged uh, the, the students. And there were, you know, six to eight uh, little barefoot youngsters, uh, yeah. one biographer said. And 
uh, basically they, they just brought produce uh, of different kinds from their farms or whatever, and, and that was payment for their education. And, and she taught them what to read and write and that sort of thing was a uh, yeah I can't um, imagine uh, being being 50 years old and realizing that the, this famous novelist was a person who taught you to read uh, but, yeah and in fact there was a uh, a boy named Thomas Gallion who later became a respected physician there in Jefferson County and he he remembers uh, having Francis as his teacher at that little yeah. school yeah yeah well wow, wow. Well, well, they were there for uh, uh, several months, I guess, uh, a, a, a year more or less. Yeah, some some estimates put it around a year and a half. Um, again, there's no solid records about when they returned to Knoxville, um, although there there was some um, uh, some activity at the St. John's Episcopal Church in Knoxville by um, I don't know if I have the date here. I believe it was by about um, uh, sometime in October of 1866. Is that right, or 1867? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. St. John's had been founded. 66, something yeah. like that. Uh, St. John's had been founded, uh, I think, back in the 1840s, uh, largely by uh, some English immigrants who, who were here and just you know, missed, uh, missed that, that denomination. Uh, yeah. So they, they founded what you know what, what we know as St. John's uh, uh, today, it, a different church building, uh, uh, but right. it, it's the second building is there now, built in 1892. But uh, anyway, yeah. But they moved here, and then they found a very interesting place to live right away. Uh, by, uh, by the time they did settle in Knoxville, and and probably in by 1867, if not earlier. Yeah, at least by 1867, um, they they found this little little cottage um, up on what was then known as Clinton Pike. It's now, um, uh, I think if you look at the map, it's called College Street. Yeah. It goes just along the, I guess that would be the Western, uh, what would that be? The Eastern yeah. edge of Knoxville College, something yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and the edge of Mechanicsville is where they live more or less, yeah. yeah. Um, on that on that hill and in fact we think it was on the campus right as far as we know uh, yeah the uh, when the college expanded after the, the turn of the 1900s they bought up uh, some property where the little house sat and for a couple decades at least was part of the campus or or at least near it and students knew it as the house that where francis hodgson burnett had lived and written uh the the house was notable um as the the house where uh Frances Hodgson at the time, it was before she was married, uh, wrote and submitted her first stories for publication um, because, uh, again, they were still, uh, Frances was trying to find ways to supplement the family income. Um, I don't know if by that time her brother John had started working at, at the saloon downtown, but um, uh, her brother, older brother Herbert was working for Joseph Wood, uh, a jeweler and, and watchmaker down Gay Street. Who interestingly has a literary connection too because he's the grandfather of Joseph Wood Crooch. Uh, and right. he, was, he, was an, he was an Englishman, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, so he was, uh, uh, that's where the Wood and Joseph Wood Crooch came from is this, yeah. uh, this, this watchmaker who, anyway, they're all, it's all surprisingly connected. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah, they, but they, they lived on, on, on that, until I, I've heard people, uh, some people have estimated that she might have lived somewhere uh, farther to the northwest. Uh, and uh, do, you've heard those stories too, I guess, that might have been closer to Western Heights or, or Beaumont or something. But uh, I've, I've heard, um, I saw some old articles and, you know, I'm, uh, we're very thankful to have uh, a great digitized collection of, of old Knoxville newspapers now, pretty much from every era you can go on and, and search newspapers uh, and see what comes up. But of course, newspapers don't always get it right. And um, at some point, uh, one journalist referred to the site of Francis Hodgson Bur Burnett's home there as Flagpole Hill, which, which was actually further up the hill. Um, there was some sort of a, a reservoir or, or something up at the top of that Flagpole Hill. Um, Whereas I've, I've heard the, 
the hill uh, called Longstreet's Hill, uh, there where the college, Knoxville College was built. Um, someone else referred to it as Pern Hill, which I couldn't find many references to that. Um, but it's basically uh, the site was, a after the home was demolished, people kind of pinpointed the location saying that it was basically between the president's home, which is still there, uh, that old kind of decaying home on the corner of College Street and is it Exeter? I can't remember the name of that cross street. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the Hodgson Cottage was between the, the president's home and the chapel, McMillan Chapel that's still there. Okay. And um, at, at one point in the 40s, uh, a little marker was, was placed there, uh, the approximate site. But um, as we'll talk about later, that, that went missing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, she described all this in a, in a, uh, she never wrote an autobiography, but she wrote a, a, a very fascinating reflection on her youth uh, called The One I Knew the Best of All. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that you've, uh, you've looked at this, and it's almost a fairy tale like telling of her story in the third person. And she calls herself, what was it, the little small person? person. The small person, yeah. Um, but this was, I'm, I'm glad to say it's, it's been in print before, but uh, a, a, a group out of, uh, out of uh, Maryville, the Blunt County uh, Friends of the Library, uh, recently uh, published a, a, just a new edition of this book um, uh, that, uh, that you can buy. And I just checked, it's there, the Union Avenue Books has a few copies of this book. But it, she describes, doesn't mention the name Knox School at all or New Market, but she talks about all the places she lived and she does talk about this place on the hill that, that she gave a name uh, because of the way it appeared. Uh, t tell us about that. There, there's actually a, a photo that I'll, I'll show. Okay, so here's a photo of uh, Fanny, Fanny E. Hodgson. Uh, this, this was her published, uh, her, her byline that she went by um, early in her career. This image of her was an engraving on the cover uh, to Peterson's Magazine in December 1872. And it was actually, the engraving was based on a photograph um, by a Knoxville photographer, uh, T.M. Schlier, and I may not be pronouncing that right, but he had a, um, an art and photography studio on Gay Street, um, roughly across the street from uh, the Bijou, or, or at least on the east side of Gay Street. And so um, this was a unique uh, photo, one of the few early photos we have of her. Um, now this, we talked about the, the little cabin in Newmarket. We don't have a photograph of it, um, but this was a family sketch. Um, I'm not sure which of the family members drew this, um, but uh, it was published in the very first biography of Frances Hodgson Burnett by her son, Vivian who was actually the, the model uh, that, who inspired uh, the character Little Lord Fauntleroy uh, mm -hmm. was her son, Vivian. And so he wrote a biography published in 1927 called The Romantic Lady. And uh, this, uh, this image right here was from that. All right, so uh, Noah's Ark here. Um, as you can see, um, I can't actually see it because I have a. Uh, this was uh, this was the name that she gave to a little uh, house that they that looked like it was it was uh, stranded on a hill, like it was yes. beached, like Noah's Ark, is yeah. I think and what she called it. That. If you look at this photo um, off to the right hand side, if you can see it, I've circled in yellow the the actual house, um, and I was able to confirm this um, since publishing this with the, the essay in the Journal of East Tennessee History. At that time, I, I didn't have confirmation, but um, this actually, the circled house over off to the right is actually the house that Francis affectionately called Noah's Ark because of the way that it seems to be just sitting there, uh, deposited there after, after a flood almost there on the, uh, the ridge. Yeah. And this, this was uh, taken in the 1890s. The, uh, the college uh, was founded in the, around 1875, I believe, and the first buildings erected eight, uh, the following year, I believe. 
And this, um, the administration building here off to the left of the photo, that was um, the, the predecessor to the administration. I'm sorry, we're getting some uh, some interference or something. Oh. But, um, can you still hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I think we, Paul is frozen for the moment, but uh, uh -oh. we're, we're talking about the uh, history of Knoxville College, I guess, which was founded by the Presbyterian Church in, the, in 1876, which mm -hmm. was after she, uh, her, she and her family had left uh, Noah's Ark. Right. But I, th I think you're back, Paul. Okay. So, um, so the administration building that's there now replaced the one that's in this photograph off to the left uh, after this one burned. Um, so again, the, the little house way off to the side of this photograph was a very simple house. Um, I don't even know if it was considered a full two stories. It was almost like one and a half stories um, with an attic up there and un an unfinished attic. And Frances would sit up there. Uh, she wrote about it in uh, The One I Knew the Best of All and uh, oftentimes with a cat on her lap. And she would sit up there by this window and, uh, and write her stories. And this is where she wrote her first stories uh, for publication uh, that were first published in 1868 in Godey's Ladies yeah. Magazine. Yeah. And it, it sounds the way she describes it in the, uh, in the one I knew the best of all, it sounds like it was surrounded by some forest. Uh, so I think a lot of the trees have been cleared by the time this, this uh, photograph was taken. Yeah. Probably a good 10 or more years later after they lived there. Yeah. There's a but few, love, yeah. few little trees here, but, um, but yeah, she, she, she called it the bower. And uh, it was a place where she loved to go off when the weather was nice and sit and read and kind of, hide herself amongst the trees. And I know, uh, Jack, you, you had a theory that, uh, that this might have been, at least as she described it in her, uh, her little memoir from 1893, that uh, this may have uh, been the source of a little ins inspiration for the Secret Garden. I, I think it does prefigure the Secret Garden in some ways, especially there's one story in the Secret Garden how she follows a little bird uh, uh -huh. that goes into the, this, she, she finds the Secret Garden by, by following a bird mm -hmm. that goes there. And she talks about, in, in her memoir, she talks about following birds and, and she mm -hmm. uh, goes into this, in this place in the woods uh, that she calls the bower which she she considered her her personal private domain kind of and it was it was not a walled garden but it was it was walled by nature in a way because her her family apparently didn't know about it at first i think her, her i think some of her brothers may have helped her clear it at mm -hmm. some point but but it was this this place she loved to go to get away from things and it was yeah. kind of a private it was her it was her secret garden mm -hmm. uh, when she was a, 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 a an adolescent uh, and, and and she was writing these stories. She published her first stories uh, when she was what eighteen years old, right? Uh, that was the what uh, the, the very first one, hearts and mm -hmm. uh, hearts and diamonds, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but that was uh, so she. And it's interesting that she in her book she represents herself almost as if she's younger than than that even. Uh, yeah, so and the, that that definitely. Uh, you get the impression that that you're reading about a a very young girl rather than a teenager, yeah. um, but you know again, there there's a, a great story that uh, that most of you all have heard about how she raised money to pay for the postage and the paper for her first stories is by picking berries on that hillside, and uh, she. Um, uh, she actually got a couple of the neighbor girls who lived kind of toward the foot of the hill. To they're African American kids, aren't they? They're, yeah. They're, yeah, they they might have been um, mixed uh, racially. I'm not sure, but um, but it was the the family of Abraham and Cynthia Gay, and actually Cynthia, uh, who they called Aunt Cynthia, was one of the few character names, uh, real character names that we get in this. Uh, this little memoir that Francis wrote. And so, um, so the, those girls uh, can be credited with helping start the career of one of the world's yeah. most famous uh, yeah. authors. She, she used that money to buy stationery and postage to, uh, yeah. to send uh, the, the stories away. And, and I love the fact that whether she was there or not, it was, I'm sure the berries were sold 
on Market Square. Uh, that, that's another literary connection of, yeah. uh, of Market Square. Yeah, and and I know uh, the Custom House wasn't there yet, but I'm thank you for pointing that out. That uh, you know, while she's she was in Knoxville, this new post office was erected and opened during her time there, and she would have gone there to send out her newly finished stories and send them on to New York. So it's uh, it's neat to think that 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 building's still there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they looked there for uh, probably three years or so in, in Noah's Ark, um, and uh, uh, but they uh, uh, her uh, they they found a better place, a larger place at least to live. It wasn't uh, posh, certainly, right. but, uh, but 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 tell us about that. What we know of, of this of this other place, and it, it, she all, she gave that place a name as well. Yes. Yeah, so, so we have Noah's Ark, and then um, uh, apparently the, between Francis's uh, publications and her brother's uh, jobs down, downtown Knoxville, they had apparently raised enough money or improved their situation enough that they could move into town. And um, so I, I'm still curious about how they, they found this place. Um, you know, it, it obviously must have been for rent, a um, uh, place that came to be known as Vagabondia Castle. Um, uh, I think just because of the uh, the kind of artistic lifestyle they were they were seeking. You know, uh, Frances was now a published author. She was also teaching music um, as an additional way to raise money. Um, her brother Herbert was. A watchmaker by trade but he was also an amateur painter and he was a very fine musician and he started to get a lot of gigs downtown uh, for different events and and groups and um and yeah. so they Hudson's orchestra is a, yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It became well known downtown and in the 1870s right yeah. and um during this time was uh you know, Staub's Opera House opened in 1872, and, and Herbert Hodgson's band was actually uh, employed to to play their opening night, and for uh, you know many s subsequent events, uh, yeah. played there at the Opera House and at different uh, masked uh, mask balls at Lamar House and elsewhere. So, uh, yeah, they they were um, coming into a new uh, social circle there in a lot of ways. Now, Francis's younger brother, John, um, was kind of uh, maybe coming into his own separate social circle, perhaps, um, you know, you, you get the idea reading the biographies that their mother, uh, Eliza, was not happy at his choice to become a bartender uh, there in, mm -hmm. in the basement of the Lamar house. And so, um, you know, that's a lot of people kind of see that as the uh, the decision, the, the career decision that kind of doomed John Hodgson uh, for the rest of his life. And, and by the way, if you don't know, the, the, uh, the Lamar House Saloon was exactly the same space as that we know as the, the bistro uh, oh. at, at the Bijou today. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, it's been added on to a little bit, but the uh, uh, certainly the I guess the northern half of the bar was was the old Lamar House Saloon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but that was the same place where John John Hodson uh, uh, worked as a bartender for John Scherf's Saloon. It was called. Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, by the way, I should I should throw this out um, just as as a an invitation to those of our viewers this evening. If if at any time you all have questions. Um, Feel free to to type them in in the chat window, and um, uh, Paul or Nicole will uh, kind of field those later. Or we'll we'll definitely leave some time for for comments. Um, you know, if some good ones come up, we could even throw them out uh, here. You know, as as we talk. Uh, but I definitely look forward to to your all's questions and, and comments um, as we talk. But yeah, that Vagabondia, uh, I can throw up another picture here. So we have Noah's Ark, which we've talked about. And then we have uh, Vagabondia Castle. And this is another uh, of their residence, residences that I've been able to confirm the location since I published the, the essay 
um, is, is here. This is a photo from 1865, a great photo of the north bank of the uh, Holston River at that time, as it was called. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's here at the, um, what would be the south? Here's Front Street that goes in front of the house, kind of hard to tell. And, and we're kind of looking at the area that we now know as uh, World's Fair Park. Uh, roughly, right, uh, and just to the, to the the southern end of that near the river. Yeah, here's um, Henley Street, so uh, where the bridge would come across now. Um, that's basically right there, at, uh, front the corner of Front Street and Henley um, is is this house circled in yellow, uh, and that's Bagabandia Castle. Um, there was uh, someone had said that. Um, the Hodgson's chose this house because it's tiers of wide verandas made it resemble a boat. And, uh, you know, I, su I suppose out of all these homes down here on Front Street that that might resemble the, a boat the most. Um, but it was, you know, very close. So their backyard basically ran down to the river. Uh, there's a river street here also. And over here, uh, about a block east of there was the gas works and in in one of their letters and I still haven't tracked down the the original letter to find out when it was written but Fanny made some comment about having to to live near the gas works um, as as part of their their shabby existence in Knoxville um, but they, but they had a boat or something. At least in the book, they they have a a, a boat that they that they uh, take down to the river, and and that was just part of the the social scene. I've run across right. this another. Uh, this is something that young people did was take boats out onto the river and sometimes mm -hmm. go swimming in the river. And right. Swimming contests. And yeah, they would they would uh, when they weren't inside playing music with their friends, they'd be boating on the river. Um, there was there was an island out here in the middle where these uh, some of these trees probably were growing. Um, there was an island before they were dredged by TVA, I guess, uh, where uh, supposedly Francis and one of her uh, friends there were walking along, staring out uh, over that island toward the bluffs, and uh, Francis made up a story about some uh, Native Americans just apparently off the top of her head, and uh, uh, this person later wrote it down, uh, just kind of a summary um, and if not for that, that story would have been lost. It was never one Francis published. Um, but it was definitely a, the site of a lot of creative, uh, creative experiences. Um, a, an interesting photo I, I saw today, uh, what's apparently that same house, I'm not sure, but this was taken a few years before, uh, two or three years before the Hodgson's moved into it. This was taken on March 8, 1867, during the Great Flood. Uh, the, the Freshet, I guess, is that what they call it, Jack? Yeah, the Freshet, yeah. Uh, here's the gas works right here. Uh, the the wow. chimney of that. And I believe this, the little, <laughs> uh, the little uh, peak of this house right here, I believe this was the, uh, this might have been where the, uh, the man who owned this house uh, lived and he had to be rescued from a second story window. Wow. Uh, wow. Here. Yeah, the, the, the freshet of 1867, that was uh, the spring flood that was uh, just uh, drowned Chattanooga almost, but it, it made a, an island uh, for a, a, a day or two of downtown Knoxville because mm -hmm. first and second creek flooded and then joined together behind on the north side of, of Knoxville. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was uh, this was the worst flood we've ever had in in our recorded history, and in, in I think in, in early spring of, of 1867. Yeah, and they uh, I found some articles from uh, 1873 to where there was another pretty significant flood that that never got quite up never got up quite this high, but they were uh, there were definitely people taking measurements to compare it to the high water mark from from this 1867 flood. Yeah. Um, this I think is a flood that destroyed the Union Bridge over the river and also destroyed some of the bridges over the First Creek as well and they had to rebuild all those things. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, uh, 
so their um, their mother died in um, March of uh, 1870, as, as we saw the the tombstone at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and so suddenly, these there were five siblings plus their there was a cousin, I think, that had come over from England with them, a, a Boone cousin. And then there were all these uh, local friends, musicians that would just be in and out of the house. And so it, it was a very uh, bohemian crowd. Yeah. And uh, there, there was a description from a draft for this novel, Vagabondia, um, one of their early drafts that Francis had, had written in a, a notebook. Um, described described the interior of the home um, as a poor little square parlor with a queer look about it, a threadbare and jaded but once rich carpet on the floor, its large medallions oddly out of place, taken into consideration with the size of the room, numberless pictures hanging on the walls, numberless books and papers scattered upon tables and chairs, numberless sheets of music manuscript and otherwise lying here and there near various musical instruments, here was a room truly making no pretensions on earth to anything but shabbiness, overpowering and irredeemable, and still at the same time impressing the beholder in defiance of all rules of nature with an index of presiding spirits at once general, careless, and desperately cheerful. So that was uh, sort of the, uh, the impression that... Uh, yeah, it sounds like Greenwich Village in the '50s or something. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it's uh, it's a uh, uh, every generation has something like that. Yeah, but but, um, but after a while, and, and actually, it wasn't just in Vagabondia where you get this same sense of the kind of the family dynamic. Uh, there was a short story published in uh, Peterson's magazine in April 1878 called um, "The Black Lace Mantilla." And again, this was, this was set, Fanny set the action in Europe, but she modeled these characters on her and her siblings. Um, and she wrote, there were four of us, Philippa, Meg, myself, and our brother Lawrence, who was our head and protector. Lawrence was based on her older brother, Herbert. Uh, she wrote, we were poor and rather proud people. At least we were rather proud of our old name. Each of us was the Possessor, possessor of the smallest of incomes. And these little incomes added to the proceeds of Larry's pictures. So Lawrence was an artist, supported us and allowed us to indulge in our favorite bohemian style of living, first in one place and then in another. Yeah. So yeah. she did kind of continue to draw on this, but uh, within a few years, just about all of her siblings had married off, um, yeah. even before she had, she had uh, married. And so, I love that picture, though, of, of young people who were late teens, probably no other adults because their mother has died at this point. Right. It's just uh, it's just a bunch of teenagers and young people uh, taking care of each other in, in right. a big house uh, near downtown Knoxville. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're uh, uh, gosh, time's flying. I'm, I'm surprised. I, I wonder if we should go ahead and, and talk about, uh, you know, she 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 finally got married. Uh, yeah, and we, she was not Francis, Fanny Hodgson anymore. She was Francis Hodgson Burnett. Tell us yeah. uh, about Swan well, Burnett. She, uh, she married, she married uh, a young man named Swan Burnett, who was a, had graduated medical school. She had actually met him when the family lived in Newmarket. Um, and between 1866 and 1870, something like that. He was back and forth up um, to different medical schools, uh, finally established his own medical practice in 1871 in Knoxville. And his specialty was um, uh, diseases of the eye and stuff like that. But he ended up doing a lot of uh, general practitioner type things. Uh, uh, who was it? General uh, or Captain Rule is... Is that right? He uh, was he was he mayor at one time. William Riddle, yeah, was mayor in the eighteen seventies. He was okay. an editor most of his life, but uh, he was the okay. guy to, to make con literary connections again. Was the, the uh, mentor of Adolf Fox, the founder of the modern New York Times. That's right. Well, yeah. uh, so uh, you know, at, during this, there was a smallpox epidemic in uh, eighteen seventy three. Uh, in the spring, and uh, William Rule, the mayor, actually, actually um, appointed Swan to head this new smallpox hospital 
uh, over near the National Cemetery. So he, he was gaining a reputation, but he wasn't able to, have, you know, specialize the way he wanted to. So, um, you know, they, they actually, uh, after a while, chose to go off to, um, to Europe so that he could continue his schooling. Um, and, um, but they, they actually had their, um, well, actually, I, I totally skipped them having their first child in Knoxville. Uh, their son, Lionel, uh, was actually born in Knoxville. And I had thought that it was on Temperance Hill where he was born, but come to find out it was actually in the house um, known as Tinker Tavern, um, which uh, Jack knows some about. Uh, Tinker Tavern is actually where the family moved um, when, when Lionel was born, because that's where the nanny, uh, they hired a, a former slave, uh, Priscilla Whitson, that they, na they, they called Aunt Prissy. And she lived with the family there in the house that was later known as Tinker Tavern. Yeah, I, I, a little background on that. That was on uh, on Henley Street uh, back when Henley Street was a little two lane uh, road and didn't didn't cross the river. Um, but uh, I got a a a surprising call. I think the first time I ever wrote about Francois Hasenbrunet in the Metropolis in the nineties, hmm. uh, a an elderly lady called me at home. Uh, I was fixing supper and didn't have a uh, a, a, a notes to take, and uh, hmm. and she uh, she. Uh, she was telling me about this this place that she remembered, and it was a tea room. In the twenties, uh, women had uh, tea rooms, and they they went there and they played cards and they had uh, lectures and so forth. And it was there were several tea rooms in town, but her favorite one was called Tinker Tavern, and it was only there for a couple of years, I think, but on on Henley Street. And she said there was a plaque on the wall that said Francis Hodson Burnett uh, used to live here, yeah. uh, and. Uh, and that was, uh, and we had begun, you and I had talked about this uh, over the years and had almost begun to doubt that that was a, uh, an, a real thing, but, yeah. but you found something about it that they actually did live there when they were first married and had, a, had a, their first baby. Yeah, that, that was the first time I'd had something, uh, some pretty solid evidence based on this lady's recollection that where she had actually lived there with the family in that house. So uh, that's one thing that, uh, that I'm looking for any of you listening who are familiar with that this this would have been the 700 block of West Cumberland Avenue just past Henley Street I ha I have not found a photograph of that block I found uh, photographs of the 600 block across Henley Street where Samuel High School the mayor had a, a home there Lizzie Crozier French had a home there on the 600 block of West Cumberland um, but I haven't found a single photograph. So that's one, uh, one thing I'm, I'm looking for and looking for help in finding. Very literary, uh, literary little neighborhood there, but, uh, that, uh, that you found something astonishing that, that, uh, that James Agee's mother, uh, uh lived there with her family, uh, before she was married. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I'm, I don't know whether she knew the connection to Francis Hudson Burnett. Uh, but uh, but this was uh, she lived there. When, when was that? It was in, it would have been the in the 1890s um, yeah, yeah, yeah. before the the Tylers moved to Clinch Avenue. Yeah, and yeah, so they, yeah. I'm sure they were renting it from somebody. So there's no deed record. Um, just like the Burnetts rented all their residences in Knoxville. So uh, there's very very little deed uh, evidence uh, for them. But but yeah, that was quite an overlap uh, to find out that. James H. Yeah. mother lived in that same house, uh, later known as. We, we think that house was torn down for the expansion of Henley Street when they built the Henley Street Bridge, uh, when they opened the Grace Smith Mouse National Park. So that was, that neighborhood was kind of obliterated at that right. time. Another person who lived there was uh, Tennessee Williams' father and grandfather, both lived right. together there for a while, not in that house, but yeah. uh, close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a, a fascinating neighborhood. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but she lived in how many different places? Uh, in, in at, at least married? five. Uh, you know, people at, decades later would claim that that she lived in such and such house. They might have been confused. Someone said she lived in a, a house owned by Parson Brownlow, uh, which I, I haven't found any records to support that. Um, they it might be that that person was thinking of uh, Hiram Barry 
who was uh, a publisher in Knoxville, and he actually owns the uh, Vagabondia Castle House. And he was the one that had to be rescued from his second story window there on River Street during the 1867 flood. So um, again, it's, it's hard, hard to know uh, exactly because you'll find little references in newspapers um, and in, unless you find something in the deed records or something else uh, more substantial, it's hard to yeah. it's hard to say other than just mentioning it as a possibility. Yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, um, uh, one. I want to mention one thing, and, and then if you have any more pictures, we can show them. But um, the uh, <clears throat> she was here for a while, uh, just writing fiction, uh, and she did. She took a trip to England uh, mm -hmm. in 1873. Two. Two. Yeah. And uh, and and wrote uh, some accounts of that for the Knoxville papers, and, oh, right. uh, and so uh, they, she did little travelogues about her her mm -hmm. time back in her home country um, in, uh, in the early 1870s for for the Knoxville newspapers. Yeah, and I think it was the Chronicle, wasn't it? Uh, I believe so. And and that was, was a paper. Was... Yeah, that that Adolph Fox, the future founder of the New York Times, was working for the Chronicle at the time, and oh, I, I love the I love the fact that he might have set the type for it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting connections between people, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but anyway, she was uh, uh, married and and uh, began getting more serious with her life and and uh, or, or uh, you know, and and eventually moved away. But uh, tell did, uh, what, what other do you have? Do you have other other, other pictures to show? Uh, where it's yeah. uh, seven o'clock. I just want to go ahead and uh, show whatever you have and Do them real quick. Uh, we wrap up. The, uh, I mentioned that uh, Temperance Hill is another place where they lived. Um, this was on uh, a house identified on East Hill Street, which was later uh, Payne Avenue, and yeah. Cross Street was Patton Street. So this, is... this, this was totally, this whole neighborhood was obliterated with the uh, Urban the Renewal Morning View uh, yeah. uh, Urban Renewal Project. Yeah. And uh, which is sad because we lost so many uh, great homes, and um, of course the the black community uh, later was this was kind of their the the heart of their community and, and their business. Uh, um, this is not far from the Coliseum uh, like, today. Uh, yeah. yeah, a couple blocks, I guess, north of that. Um, but um, this Tinker Tavern, this is the best I could do as far as an image. Uh, mm -hmm corner, uh, northwest corner of Henley and Cumberland is, is the house. Of course, all these houses look this, just about the same in this, in these drawings, but. Is, is uh, this from 1880, 1886? Yeah. yeah. So I would love to find a photograph of this, of this block somewhere where we can get a, a better idea of what that house looked like. I, I it was a brick house from, from the, uh, descriptions, a few descriptions I've seen of it. That's Tinker Tavern though. Yeah. Um, so Gay Street, uh, 1869, uh, this was when, uh, around the time when uh, the Hodgson's moved to Vagabondia Castle. So she would have seen a Gay Street very much like this. Uh, one thing I, th I thought, zooming in, I thought it was interesting that in 1869, there was an art gallery. This is yeah. T.M. Clear and two yeah. bookshops there within a couple blocks of each other. Um, I've never so, noticed that. That's, yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. So as as wild west as this looks, you know they had some some culture yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then of course the Lamar House, uh, Fanny attended dances there, and uh, this basement area. I guess this must was this shortly after they graded Gay, Gay Street. I, I think it, it probably was. I think I think it was the eighteen fifties that they graded it down. It was it was okay. basement until then. It may have seen basementy after that, but, yeah. but uh, that's one of the rare buildings actually got taller <laughs> over the yeah. years. Um, Lamar House and then Staub's Opera House, that's where Herbert played for opening night. And several of uh, Fanny's, uh, Francis's works that were that she adapted as stage works uh, played here. I know Little Lord, Lord Fauntleroy, I think, um, was shown there in the 1890s. Yeah, uh, Esmeralda and, and some of the others she wrote. So, and and, and Paul, you're working on a project about uh, the history of that building, uh, and you're looking for people who remember the Lyric Theater, which was torn down in 1956. So there are people out there right. who remember this building, and uh, yeah. 
be valuable to get to talk to to anybody out there that remembers the lyric. And yeah, I'll um, I I have my email address here at the end, but you can also contact Jack uh, or the Knoxville History Project. Um, I would love to interview people that actually remember going inside this building. Of course, it was remodeled heavily uh, a couple times over the years, but um, more and more after it opened, after it became the lyric in the 1920s more and more uh, it kind of went from being a legitimate theater to just a, a wrestling venue. Um, yeah. But if, if also, any of you out there have firsthand memories of, of yeah. attending some event there, I'd love to talk to you. They, they had uh, WNOX uh, uh, barn dances and things like that too. Uh, Chet Atkins and the Carter sisters pl yeah. played there in the late forties. Um, yeah. so it was, uh, it saw a lot of, a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, this this is a photo I found of the Literary Gym Club. They're the ones who placed a, a marker at the uh, the where the Hodgson cabin had set near Knoxville College. Um, so this this was the the year uh, the group that that had that done of uh, Knoxville College students. Um, and that marker is that marker is missing. So if anybody knows anything about it, uh, right. please, yeah, please uh, please let somebody know. Yeah. Um, this was a baby carriage that the Burnett's left in uh, Newmarket when they moved for the last time away from East Tennessee. It's now at the Jefferson County Courthouse in Dandridge. Wow. Um, this is a stone that was placed in the mid-90s down on Volunteer Landing. Uh, Jack wrote the, uh, the text for it, but unfortunately the stone was placed about a third of a mile east of where it should sit. Uh, it's it's underneath the Gay Street Bridge where it should be uh, just just west of the Henley Street Bridge if it were accurate. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and I knew that at the time that they, they just uh, because it was they had some reason for putting it there instead of they transposed it with the Nikki Giovanni stone and yeah. I don't know I, 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 I would I would keep arguing if I could. <laughs> um, and of course the Secret Garden is is another. Um, probably the most recent type of memorial, even though it's, it's also a memorial to a lady, uh, Andy Ray, who yeah. died, um, but who, who had an affinity for uh, uh, Burnett's works. And so this garden was created over at the Knoxville Botanical Garden and Arboretum. It's a, yeah. it's a really cool place to visit. I, Andy was a close friend. She had a, a dress shop on Market Square for many years called Vagabondia and, mm -hmm. and had a copy of the book uh, in, in there. The only one I think I've ever seen was yeah. the one that uh, Andy had of, of Francis Osborne, that's the first book. Yeah. Um, two, two photos. This again is the 1872 uh, picture of uh, Francis and this one was the one on the right from more turn of the century uh, where she was older. But um, again, I'm seeking information, photos of Tinker Tavern, uh, 700 block of West Cumberland, no longer there. Um, also in, information about uh, Burnett's missing memorial plaques. Uh, there were a couple of them in Knoxville that are no longer around. And then uh, photos and recollections of the Lyric, uh, formerly Stobbs Theater. Um, my email is pfbrown074 at gmail.com. Uh, or you can contact Knox School History Project and they'll get, they'll get you in touch with me. And I, I really appreciate all you, uh, your attention. And I don't know if we, there's time for questions or not, but. Um, yeah, there are time for questions. If anybody else, uh, if, anybody, if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, uh, I had one, did her mother work in Knoxville? I don't know that um, Eliza, Eliza Hodgson was employed anywhere. Um, I, my guess is that the, the children supported her, uh, through their employment for, uh, Francis's publications and the, the two sons, uh, jobs in downtown. Good question. Yeah. I have a couple of comments and then I'll end with a question for you. Yes. Uh, the brother that was a watchmaker. Uh, obviously, at that time, uh, wristwatches didn't exist. They were pocket watches. Uh, they were something that uh, were well-to-do people would have or some professionals. The uh, railroad industry, for example, depended on pocket watches for maintaining their, uh, their schedules. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, at, at any rate, the jeweler, jewelers of uh, the mid 1800 could take uh, watch mechanisms that were made by a handful of countries. There were some up in New England, uh, the Germans, the uh, Swiss were excellent watch mechanism makers. Mm -hmm. Jewelers could make a watch case. They could pr produce uh, unique dials. That's the watch face with the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. They could customize the, the hands on the pocket watch. And so with a, a handful of basic uh, internal mechanisms, uh, an individual could obtain a, a unique pocket watch. Mm -hmm. And I was curious uh, with that background, whether you knew whether the brother was assembling pocket watches in that, uh, in that type of operation mm -hmm. or whether he was actually uh, making the entire watch. From, that's a great question. Uh, from the information I've read, there were, he was, uh, in time, he became quite an accomplished watchmaker himself. From, from what I understand, there were some um, things written in the newspaper that he had created uh, a kind of electric clock at some point. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how much they described that, but there was also a, a story of him creating a, a working uh, timepiece that actually fit inside a ring setting. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he was quite accomplished from what I gather. And he also played in, and repaired pipe organs. So he, he was very gifted mechanically uh, from what I read. I, I'd love to know more about him, but that's a great question. Thanks uh, both of you, Jack and Paul. This was uh, exceeded expectations for me. Um, Given that the plaques have disappeared, which I find rather distressing, mm -hmm. and that um, you know, myself, it took me years of living in Knoxville before I even knew there was a connection um, with Frances Hodgson Burnett. Um, and I grew up on her, especially the secret garden. Mm -hmm. I have my own secret garden. Uh, to boot, so I'm that uh, connected to her. But so I, I noticed that there's a statue, of, well, at least of characters from the Secret Garden in New York. I mean, yes. if it were possible to cre uh, create a statue of Francis Hodgson Burnett in, in Knoxville mm -hmm. that nobody could steal, like a plaque, <laughs> uh, where should it be, or where mm -hmm. could it be? Oh, that's a good question. It is. Yeah. Um, Jack may have some ideas on that. It's it's interesting because that the the statue in York you mentioned that was dedicated and uh, featured characters from Secret Garden. Uh, Francis had a, a nephew in Knoxville, uh, Bert Hodgson, who was a musician and also a businessman, and he he read about that and he said, "Look, it it looks." it looks as if New York cares a whole lot more about Frances Burnett than we do. I mean, she, she you know, grew up part, partly here and started her career. Why don't we have something? And so, um, yeah, I would love to see something like that. And I don't know if, uh, if it represent her <laughs> uh, depicting her writing or, or picking berries or, um, you know, I, I can imagine a, a lot of different type poses or depictions uh, but as far as the the place, um, yeah, that's a good question. That is a good question. I, I, I'm, I might be inclined to I have two ideas. One uh, is World's Fair Park, which was very close to two of her homes, the Vagabondia and uh, Tinker Tavern. And uh, another is the Botanical Gardens, where there's already the Secret Garden. And if you haven't been there, it's a, it's a lovely place to see. They don't tell you where it is. It's supposed yeah. to be kind of a surprise, and 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 uh, and it is, it is to many people. Uh, but I think it's kind of a work in progress. It's not completed. I think it's going to be added to uh, as the years go by. I have a question, um, Paul. You talked about the younger brother John. Yes. Yes. Who. Um, his mother disapproved of him working in the saloon at the Lamar house, and that was his undoing. Could you tell more about that, please? Sure. He um, supposedly he was um, 
you know, I, he's kind of a mystery because out of, out of either brother, he's the, he's the one that they biographers speak of least, but, um, it's interesting because, uh, he was, you know, he had married, he'd had a son, um, by about 1888, but, uh, in 1890, um, his wife filed for divorce um, because of the drinking that, that had, had returned. And there was a story that Francis had actually come back for a brief visit in, into Knoxville that year in 1890. That's also the year that her son Lionel died, um, which she was really broken up after. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's that much evidence as far as, except for this one, but, um, but John was known to be the brother, a brother of Francis Hodgson Burnett. And um, supposedly she often sent him money because she knew that he was, he was down and out. Um, but he, he was kind of regarded well because of her. And he, I think, at least according to what you read in the paper, was kind of ashamed of himself and wouldn't talk about her much because of, I think, feeling ashamed of what his life was like and, and didn't want to um, spoil her reputation, I guess. Um, but he, he actually died at age 57 of uh, spinal meningitis, and his body actually lay in the mortuary, and because he was penniless basically when he died the the owner of the mortuary contacted Francis Burnett in in England I believe uh, requesting that she send funds for John's burial and uh, apparently she did but o only enough for him to be buried in his mother's plot without a gravestone um, which is is sad and and you you hope that there was some some other reason why that uh, that she wouldn't contribute to his head, headstone, um, but but that's kind of an odd thing that I first read about in Jack's writings is that there's there's two people buried under that tombstone that uh, that Paul showed at the beginning, um, but we only read about Eli Eliza Hodgson being buried right there, so um, yeah. it's kind so of a then, sad sad ending. Yeah. Yeah, he lived, was li literally living in the street, uh, living in the Bowery at, at one time down on South Central. And um, but his son uh, grew up to become a, 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 a notable songwriter and uh, a, 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 a kind of a supporter of entertainment in general. There was a, 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 an auditorium downtown called Hodgson's Auditorium, which had mostly African-American like jazz music in the 1920s and so forth. So that was he was the last. Uh, Hodgson to uh, to live in Knoxville that I know of, um, but uh, yeah, interesting interesting guy. I would have liked to know. More, I'd like to know more about him uh, myself. Yeah, well, it's also interesting, Jack. You said uh, Bert Hodgson was the last Hodgson to live in Knoxville. He actually died in 1965, which was exactly a century after the Hodgsons first arrived in yeah. in East Tennessee. So it was kind of a, a, a definite closure to that family because he never had children. Bert didn't. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, he lived in the Allen home community, I believe, at one time. Yeah, interesting guy. Um, Bradley Reeves is especially interested in Bert, Bert Hodgson's uh, music and other things from the 20s, especially yeah. 20s and 30s. Uh, one, one thing we didn't mention, you mentioned that, uh, that a sense of place uh, was not quite as strong with her, but there is one uh, story, uh, one book that she wrote uh, based on Knoxville, and, and I picture it when I see oh, that. Wow picture of Gay Street is a, a, a very obscure now novel, I'm sure it's out of print, mm -hmm. called In Connection with the Duolibi Claim. And, it, and it's not a charming children's story. It's a, mm -hmm. kind of a sort of a of a satire of, of American life or something, not unlike Mark Twain or somebody. It, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's about the you know, complications and families and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it's, he, she describes this post-war uh, town, which looks, and it's, it's called Delisleville. Yeah. but it's not it's it's exact it's knoxville precisely and, and yeah. the way she describes the uh the churches and stuff is, is mm -hmm. exactly as it was when she when she it's lived here yeah. he also mentioned uh in that she also mentioned uh 
described is called the Del Delisle House, which uh, you it's got to be the Lamar House because later years she said that Lamar House was where all the balls, all the important balls were held. Mm -hmm. So there's there's that, and there's even a a little description, short description of of the market square where all the wagons would pull up and stuff. And, you know, that, that would make a great inscription there on market square. I think. Yeah. yeah. I need to read that better. I, I don't remember those, uh, those passes it's been a long time, but yeah, part of the, part of the Bijou theater history, I guess, if the, if that uh, Delisle house uh, description is, is, is accurate. Yeah. Read, read some, uh, during this lockdown, uh, the, the, the precious little bit of, that might be left in it, read some Francis Austin Burnett before, uh, before we start mixing uh, together again. And yeah. uh, especially if you have a kid around, read, read it out loud. I read the, the secret garden out loud to my daughter a long time ago and she, she, she didn't uh, get bored at a single page, I think, but it was, it's a great book. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again to Rosalind Hackett for uh, sponsoring tonight.